Well, good morning, Walden Church. Last week, we talked about revival and perhaps redirecting our faith and putting a little bit more love and a little bit more effort and a little bit more energy into it, perhaps uh, spending more time in our love for the church and for God. And so I think, you know, when we, when we start talking about things like that and, and we talk about growing and we talk about discipleship and making changes, one of the things that we as Christians might consider is, I really should read my Bible more this year. Great, if you had that thought, great. That's a good thing. I, I think we should have that desire. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The Bible should be like food to us. We should crave it. We should feel the lack when it is not in us. Uh, it, it should never be an afterthought. So I want to cover a lot of ground today and perhaps uh, not just talk about how to study or uh, what Bible is best, but learning some things about the Bible and how we should read it. The Bible was written over a 1500 year span. That's more than 40 generations. And it was written by more than 40 authors. The writers of the Bible come from Asia and Africa and Europe, and it was written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Today, the Bible is translated into 2,400 different languages. That's roughly 90% of the world. And so to this day, it still doesn't matter if I teach adults or youth. I will always come across people who say that reading the Bible is boring, that it sounds like Shakespeare or, you know, I'm just, I'm just reading a book from school. You know, after all, that's why I come to church, so I don't have to read the Bible. Uh, I can have somebody read it for me. <laughs> but I think it's all in how you look at it. You can think of the Bible as a boring textbook, or you can look at it as a grand, epic tale. Here's some stories from the Bible. These, this is what the Bible includes. A man who lived to be 900 and 69 years old. A man who used a rock to sleep on. A baby that was born with a red thread tied around its finger. A war that was won because a man held his hands in the air. A man that was spoken to by a donkey. A man that was so tall his bed was over 13 feet long. In the Bible, there's a law where women had to shave their heads before they could marry. In the Bible, the sun stood still for an entire day, and in another story, the sun rolled backwards. In the Bible, there's a story about a man who walked the earth naked for three years. There's a story about a woman who killed a man by driving a tent peg through his head. What about a story of an army of 700 left-handed men? A man who had 12 fingers and 12 toes. Or an ax head that floated on the water. I could read to you a story about a man who had a thousand wives, a man who lived 15 extra years just because he prayed, or an entire graveyard that was resurrected. The Bible is anything but boring. And all through its topics and its poems and its songs and its stories and law, you will find the grand story that God made us, that God loves us. So today I wanted to look at this crazy book because it is a crazy book. It's like no other book on the planet. You can't compare the Bible to any other book because somewhere along the way we were handed this book and it could have been at confirmation, it could have been at Sunday school or graduation, or we got it as a Christmas present and we were told, here, read it. And so we try to read it. We try to read it like other books because we don't know any other way. Or we study it the way we studied books in school because we don't know any other way. But the Bible can't be read like any other book or studied like any other book because it's not any other book. Not to mention that no matter who you are or where you go, you're always going to find disagreement about how it should be read or how it should be interpreted, or taught, or translated, or studied. So where do we begin? 
Well, we just got through saying the Bible is a story. And it's a story about God's love. So the other side of that is the Bible is not an instruction manual. And growing up, there used to be a popular bumper sticker that said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. What that bumper sticker was trying to say was, we believe everything the Bible says. So we practice everything the Bible teaches. Hogwash. Baloney. That's totally not true. That is not true. Why? Because nobody does everything the Bible says. If the Bible were actually an instruction manual, why don't we spend more time following the instructions? For instance, the Bible says to practice a Sabbath. So let's just forget about the part that the Sabbath is actually originally on Saturday. How many of us could actually say that we take a full biblical day off from work and we dedicate it to the Lord? And that's one of the Ten Commandments. 24 hours. No work. Worship. How can we say that settles it if we don't practice it? Jesus says in John 13, 14, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Those are Jesus' words, right? Does that settle it for you? Because I have never washed somebody else's feet. 2 Corinthians 13 says, Greet one another with a holy kiss. And you thought it was bad just shaking hands. Apparently, we should all be kissing one another. Jesus says in Luke 14, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Again, those are Jesus' words. How come the seemingly hard and fast instruction about foot washing and giving up possessions, kissing one another, aren't followed more closely by Christians? The Bible says it and that settles it? No. We pick and choose what we follow and what we don't. And listen, none of this is to shame us or embarrass us because we all do it. Billy Graham did it. Your famous TV preacher does it. Your favorite biblical author does it. Or your favorite worship leader does it. But maybe the better question is, why do we do it? And how should we do it? Because it seems to say that that settles it. We only say that for things we agree with, right? Abortion, premarital sex, homosexuality. But if the Bible tells me to wear a head covering or to give away all my possessions or to love my enemies, well then, I'm sure Jesus meant something different. Exodus 22 says, do not allow a sorceress to live. Have you ever spent your free time killing witches? And this is only a handful of verses. There are hundreds of verses like this. We live in a world where we say the Bible is black and white, but it clearly is not. And so before we go forward about maybe studying it, I want to talk about how we should read it and perhaps this filter that we apply and how best to live with it. We said the Bible is a story, right? The Bible is a story. Of course, of course the Bible is a story. It, it might even seem silly for me to repeat it or to make it one of the points, but it needs to be the foundation of how we approach the text. The Bible has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The beginning is Genesis 1 through 11, the middle is Genesis 12, Malachi 4, Matthew through Revelation, and the end is Matthew 25, Romans 8, and Revelation 21 through 22. And like a story, the Bible also has a plot, a theme, and it goes like this, creation, then the fall, then the old covenant, Christ, the new covenant, and then the end of creation. Or another way of looking at the plot would be like this. We have openness with God in the early parts of Genesis. Then we have brokenness with God through the rest of Genesis. 
The first attempt to reconcile that broken relationship through Malachi, openness and oneness with God through Christ in Matthew through a revelation, and then a perfectly united relationship with God at the end of Revelation. Every author of the Bible is writing along one of these themes, and they are recording history during one of these time periods. If you read Ezra or Malachi or Mark or Acts or Hebrews, you are jumping into one of these parts of the story. So that means knowing where you are in the story, where you begin to read, that is crucial. And so the unity of the Bible, the cohesiveness that holds all the Bible together is this grand story. And so naturally, if the Bible is a story, then we have to read it in context. Context is everything. If I showed you the last two minutes of Casablanca, you wouldn't know what was going on. If I showed you the deliberation scene in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, you might not even care what the outcome is. When you see Darth Vader shake his fist at Luke and say, I am your father, it doesn't matter if you don't understand the context of the scene. The Bible's no different. Let me give you an example. Matthew 4. He said, throw yourself to the ground, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. All right, so who is willing to follow this verse to the letter right now? I mean, it's scripture. It is scripture, right? So we know it's true, okay? But how does this passage fit into the larger story? What's the context? Well, we'd say, who is talking in this passage? Who is the voice? Who's speaking? Do you know? It's the devil, right? And who is he talking to? Jesus. Is this a verse that's meant for you and I to follow? No. So what is this? It's a conversation between Jesus and the devil. Those are really good questions when you read in context. Who is speaking? Who are they speaking to? And how does this relate to me? If the Bible is a story, you should always read it in context. And if you don't, then we run the risk of misunderstanding it. Let me give you another example. Leviticus 25, Old Testament, Old Testament law. If any of your fellow Israelites become poor and aren't able to support themselves among you, help them as you would help a foreigner and a stranger so they can continue to live among you. Do not take interest or any profit from them, but fear your God so that you may contribute to live among you. You must not lend them money at interest or sell them food at profit. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. So what does this say? This says, when your neighbor is broke, when they're, lo when they're low on funds, when they're poor, be kind, don't sell them food for profit, don't charge interest. It's in the Bible. Does that settle it for you? Of course not. And you're probably thinking of the answer right now and you just need me to say it out loud. That was then, this is now. And you know what? You are right. One of the filters that we use when we read a Bible in context is this idea that that was then and this is now. It's the reason that retail stores still charge interest or ask for a profit no matter what someone's income is, no matter if they're low income or high income or poor, it's the reason we wear fabric with multiple fibers. It's the reason our women can wear jewelry in church or not wear a head covering in church or the reason they don't have to shave their head and clip their fingernails before they get married. And it's the reason we don't all leave church on Sunday and go hunt and kill witches. Times have changed. Hebrews 1 says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. The Bible reminds us, the author of Hebrews here reminds us that God chose 
to communicate to us differently in the past than he does in the present. God remains the same. God remains the same. His word remains the same, but the methods of his communication changed. And let me just share the aha moment that, that should help us, okay? This book, the Bible, is only one means that God uses to speak to us. And this book is comprised of language. Now, that sounds obvious to us, right? But language is always shaped by context. And God chose to speak to us through many writers, chose to speak to us in a variety of ways. Think about it. The story of the Bible is comprised of law, blessing, promises, political science, world history, anthropology, psychology, poetry, metaphysics, astronomy, epistemology, correspondence, and apocalyptic writing. Not to mention the fact that we have four versions of the gospel. Why? Why don't we have just one? Well, because the story of Jesus is so much more greater and so much more beautiful than just one voice. And since the completion of scripture, now we live in a world where we, where we have the blessing of being able to read this uh, Bible in many different translations. And because we read in English, we can now benefit from the men and women who help decipher the scripture from their original texts. You know, the beautiful wife of George Burns, Gracie Allen, once said, never place a period where God has placed a comma. God is still speaking. And so we have a God who reveals himself to us at many times in various ways. In your hands is a Bible that God gave you to read. It is his story. It is the story of how he interacted with his creation and his people and how he loved them. So how do we read it? How do we read the story? Jesus says in Matthew 7, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The Bible is a story and we need to listen to the story. The Bible is God's story. And what we need to remember is God existed before the story did. God existed before the Bible. And if every Bible was one day burned and forgotten, God would still exist. God is alive. So that means his word is alive. So yes, it's a story, but it's more than a book. We read books, we study books, and sometimes we begin to treat the Bible like we treat every other book. But it's not a book like any other. No, no other book is God's story. And because God uses this book to lead us to himself, we have to learn to listen. This is God's story. This is how he chooses to communicate with us. So it's our great responsibility to listen. Maybe you read Weathering Heights in school. Maybe you read Eat, Pray, Love in book club. Those are books, but the Bible is a story that invites us into a relationship with God. And so that means we have to approach this book as a relationship. It's not an instruction manual with rules to follow. It's an invitation of love that helps us better know our creator. Yes, several authors wrote these words. Yes, it happened over generations. Yes, the Bible is comprised of many themes, but the unifying element is that God is telling his story and it's his voice. And it's our responsibility to listen to this voice. And maybe over time, we will stop asking, well, what does the Bible say? 
and we'll start asking, what does God say? And the difference is the difference between mere paper and the person. Now, earlier I said we had to read the Bible in context. Well, the reason is because we then run the danger of taking scripture out of context and then we twist the story. But the words of the Bible need to be listened to because they're more than just squiggles and dots on a page. How, how many of us have ever read a love letter? When you read it, when you read your love letter, did you just think it was as worthless as the paper that it was written on? It, it was all just squiggles and dots. You were done and you just crumpled it up and threw it in the trash. No. Words are personal exchanges. They're offerings of the person. Love letter words come from the depths of our soul and the words become more than ink. They become extensions of the person who is saying them. So phrases like, I love you, or I will be there for you, or I will always be with you, those personal exchanges matter. They matter so much because they represent a real relationship. So then how we respond to those words matters. Words like listen and hear are mentioned all throughout the Bible, something like 1,500 times. And the biggest complaint that you will ever hear God say is that the people don't listen. Even the most important verse, quoted in both Christianity and Judaism, begins with, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. You know, this year, I want our theme for 2021 to be church where you live. And we are his church. This, this is his church. And so to be his church, we need to listen. In a very real example, Joanna, my wife, will often tell me that she wishes I would listen to her better. And probably in my own defense, I always think at the time I am listening to her, but the evidence comes across in my action. Did I remember that we had dinner plans? Did I remember that trash goes out on Thursday morning? And so the relationship gets brought into question. How well do I love my wife if I don't listen and pay attention to her? Fellas, I'm talking to you. <laughs> and obviously she knows that I love her, but how much more assured of that is she when I show that I listen? Deuteronomy 17:17 17, 17 says, the king must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. You know, remember earlier I told you that in the Bible there's a story about a man who had a thousand wives. That was King Solomon. What do you think? Do you think he was a good listener to the story of scripture? No. Well, Solomon had multiple wives, so I can too. No, that's not being a good listener of the story. You are not paying attention to how God has asked us to live. Good Bible study is an act of love for God and it's listening to God. So when we approach the scriptures to study the Bible, we should be doing more than just acquiring knowledge and acquiring information. We should be listening to God because it's about love. This is a relationship that we have with him. The Bible is a story. We need to listen to the story and we need to study the story. We need to study this story. Someone once said that reading the Bible without discerning it is like trying to eat without swallowing. When you take a new class or when you buy a new book, we'll use words like Bible study. So lastly, I want to address how we study and perhaps go back to this filter that we always use when we study. Jesus says in Matthew 7, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and what? Puts them into practice. In other words, obeys. 
is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. But admittedly, right, we already said, we don't follow and we don't obey every line in the Bible. Why not? Well, probably because it's impossible. It's impossible to follow every command of scripture. You know, there was a a guy named A.J. Jacobs. He was an agnostic and he wrote a book called The Year of Living Biblically. And he took upon it himself to read the Bible through and then write down all of the laws. And he was gonna live them out literally as best as he could for this book. And so for four months, he wrote down every commandment in the Bible. He had a 72 page document of laws comprised of 700 rules that he had to follow. And so in the book that he writes, he chronicles how living out those commands made him look at his worldview and then examine scripture. And if you're wondering, by the way, no, he did not kill any witches either. A.J. Jacobs said the rules that he broke every day were do not covet, stand in the presence of the elderly, do not lie, you shall not utter the names of other gods, and be slow to anger. The rules he never broke were, you shall not marry your wife's sister, you shall not plant your field with two kinds of seed, you shall not eat eagles, vultures, black vultures, red kites, black kites, ravens, horned or screech owls, gulls, or any kind of hawk, the little owl, the cormorant, the gray owl, the white owl, the desert owl, the osprey, the stork, any kind of heron, the hoop ope, and the bat. Do not become a shrine prostitute. Now, we have to admit, 72 pages of instruction is impossible. That is, that's a monster task. Nobody is that diligent. Some theologians argue that even the Jews of that day didn't even live like that. They didn't live to those extremes. So that forces us to apply study and discernment. In our Christian tradition, we call this hermeneutics. Hermeneutics means interpretation. How do we interpret the Bible? How do we adapt? How do we adopt? It's how we make the distinctions between that was then and this is now. So we read the story, we listen to the story, and then we discern the story. We read the Bible and we'll come across a passage and we'll ask ourselves, how does this fit into the story of God? How do those answers then help me live out the story of God in 2021? This is to me why we hear Hebrews 4.12 say that scripture is the active word of God, that it is living, right? Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The author of Hebrews says that scripture is, again, more. It is more than just words on a page. It's alive and it's breathing and it's moving. The scripture actually leaves the printed page and it dives into your soul so much that sometimes it'll even cause division in you about what you had previously thought was best. Discernment is growth. Bible study is part of God's story, and it's the story that we are now called to live in. It's our time. It's the time where we live. It's the time where we obey. And of the three, this is obviously the most hardest one, right? Reading the Bible can be easy. Listening to the Bible can be easy, but discernment is hard. And it's where it gets messy. So I think it deserves special attention and it needs to be covered in prayer and it needs to be shared by the wisdom of the church and other believers. Because we, we all call on discernment for all of the things that we are unsure about. 
Nobody's going to discern the scripture about spousal abuse or whether it's right to sell your children into slavery. I mean, those things are clear, right? But many things become harder for us and unclear for us. Like, why does a loving God send people to hell? Let me give you a real example in discernment. When I was being interviewed here at the church, they asked me a question about divorce. Because in Mark 10, 2, some Pharisees come to Jesus and test him by saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, why wouldn't they already know the answer? Why, why is that a question? Why, because the Bible should be clear, right? It's black and white. To be truthful, it's not. And so this was a popular question in Jesus' day. And if you were a different rabbi, you had different opinions. So what does Jesus say? Jesus says, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Now this would agree with Genesis chapter one, right? That when two people are married, they become one. That's the biblical definition of marriage. The two become one in all regard, in every aspect. And, and this is God's desire. God's desire is that they stay one, obviously. Just as God wants to stay one with us, just as God is one with himself. That's the model that we have in Genesis chapter one. But in Matthew five, Jesus makes a discernment. And he says, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries or divorced woman commits adultery. So now we have a, a, a little bit more clarity. Maybe divorce is wrong unless there's a case of immorality. But then we jump to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, and Paul says, but if an unbeliever leaves, meaning divorce, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstance. And then if you read the whole chapter, it's true. Paul does agree with Jesus, but he takes those words and he makes his own discernment. And that is, the rules of divorce aren't always rules. And I think today that the church still stands firm in being committed to marriage, but at the same time permits divorce in cases where the marriage covenant has been broken. Now, does that mean the marriage covenant can only be broken by immorality? No, because we understand that unfaithfulness can take a lot of different forms. I think we've all witnessed throughout the years, maybe even in our own life, the different ways a marriage can break. And if you've been through divorce, you know, it's not black and white. If you've watched your parents go through divorce, you know, it's not simple. And so in these circumstances, we pour over the scriptures and we take our heart and we take our tears to God and we wrestle with these words and we discern how best to live, how best to move forward. Because the pattern is to discern the reason and to understand if that reason is in alignment with God's heart. Well, what about God says it, I believe it, that settles it. I actually saw, I actually saw this much later in life and I think I like it better. It says, God said it, and I interpreted it as best as I could in light of all the filters imposed by my upbringing and culture, which I try to control for, but you can never really do perfectly. That doesn't exactly settle it, but it does give me enough of a platform to base my values and decisions on. That's probably a much better way to look at hermeneutics. Doesn't exactly fit on a bumper sticker. So I think when the Bible says, 
don't charge interest. The story of scripture is, don't oppress the poor. When Christ says, wash one another's feet, the story of scripture is, have a servant's heart. Jesus says, give up everything. But the story of scripture asks that we put God first in every aspect of our life, that we don't allow the material things to get in the way of the spiritual. And then Bible study becomes how we take the story of God and discern how best to live today. What is true to the heart of God? And as new questions are presented, new situations arise, and then we make new discernments all the time. And yes, churches and Christians disagree on study. And yes, like I said earlier, it's not easy sometimes, but that's just the way it is. And we do the best we can. It's not even new. It's even how the authors of the Bible, how they read scripture. So where does that leave us? With the Bible, right? I own something like 26 Bibles. I'm a Bible junkie, and at one time or another, there's always a, another new fancy Bible on my wish list. But listen, none of them do me any good if I don't read them. And this is my takeaway for you. I want you to think about your Bible, yours. The one you read, or at least the one that's back at home on your bookshelf or maybe sitting on your nightstand. Do you like reading it? Do you understand it? Because I would argue that if your answer is no, I want you to go and get another one. I'm serious. What did we just get through saying? <laughs> this is the story of God. It's unlike any other book in human history. And if you own a book that you feel has a difficult translation, no helpful notes, maybe if it's, it's even missing a page or two, or in any other way doesn't excite you, then get a new one. Just some things to consider. Translation, right? You might need a different translation. The spectrum of translation is based on what? What else? Discernment. The range of Bible translations go from word for word to thought for thought. And it all depends on what you're looking for. Word for word means the best possible word in English is chosen and placed in the sentence. And it gives you the best picture of the precise, literal meaning of each word. Thought for thought translations are trying to communicate in English the point of the sentence in contemporary English. This makes the translation easier to understand, easier to read. Typically, my advice is have one of each, have both. Open them both up to the same passage and read them side by side to get a more clear understanding. What translation is dead center? Did you notice? It was NIV, right? NIV is dead center. That's why it's the number one seller. My advice is to go to the bookstore, read several translations, open them to the same passage and read them all and decide which one you like to read. The Bibles that we have in the church are ESV, English Standard Version. Notice that on the chart, it's heavily in the section for being a literal word-for-word -word Bible. That means it's great for Bible study, but it could be more difficult for casual reading. And I get asked as a pastor all the time, which translation is the best? My answer is the same. The translation that you are going to read. Having the best, most expensive, leather-bound Bible isn't going to help you if it never opens. Secondly, I like notes. I like my Bible to have notes. The reason I like good notes is the reason we talked about earlier, discernment. Much of the discernment of our day has already been discussed. Those conversations have already taken place. Those questions have already been asked. So when I'm reading, I appreciate the other person's input. I appreciate those editors and those people that have already discerned that scripture for themselves 
And yes, you are free to discern for yourself. Absolutely. But I think it's even better to do in a community of many voices. Third, every Bible has a focus. It's true. We might not always notice it, but every Bible has a focus. Some might have a focus that you lean more towards. If reading the Bible in chronological order is for you, there's a Bible for that. If you like archaeology, there's a Bible for that. If you like apologetics, there's a Bible for that. If you like language, there's a Bible for that. If you want to read it in contemporary language, there's a Bible for that. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, the message, the voice, the story, the New Jerusalem Bible. There's plenty of focuses out there that might be more appealing to you. There's nothing wrong with going out and getting a new Bible, especially if it's going to help you and assist you in your relationship with God. But what if you already know that reading a book, sitting down and reading, doesn't exactly work for you? And you're, I, you know what, I really need something different. Well, it's a good thing you live in 2021, right? It's a good thing you live in this day and age because now we can listen. We can listen to the Bible audibly. You can listen to it on MP3. You can download it to your phone. You can listen to it in your car. You can buy CDs. There's uh, CDs out there and, and Bible programs out there that'll read a portion of the Bible to you every day. It's amazing how fast you can actually get through the Bible when you're just listening to a recording. And the internet, and, and there's all kinds of Bible apps out there. There's a million different options. You can listen to uh, the Bible being read to you on YouTube and Spotify. I would look up uh, a, a channel called uh, Street Lights. Street Lights reads the Bible to you. You can buy a CD of Johnny Cash and he'll read the Bible to you. There's all kinds of Bible apps. There's daily emails that I'll just send into your inbox. And you can just read the Bible through email. You could buy a devotional that just gives you a couple verses a day and just stick it in the glove box of your truck. When you're stopped over at a job site or you're waiting for somebody in the car, just pull it out and read a couple verses. There's a company right now called Alabaster and they're putting the Bible into beautiful coffee table books that have really artful photographs and very easy to read texts. Out in the lobby right now, I have several different types of Bible and I want you to browse those. Take a picture with any of them on your phone that might pique your interest. Don't just throw your hands up in the air and say, I give up. Okay, don't do that. Or just say, you know what? This, reading the Bible doesn't work for me. You live in 2021. There has to be something out there that's gonna help you and work with this relationship, work in discipleship, work in growing you and, and the relationship that you have with God. One of my favorite quotes is from John Wesley. He says, I wanna know one thing, the way to heaven. And God himself has condescended to teach me the way. He has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God and let me be a man of one book. This morning, I pray that you discover the story of the Bible and that it's anything but boring and it's anything but ordinary. It is his story, his story of love for you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this book and perhaps all the things that we take for granted, this book becomes one of them. And so often we see it sitting there we think our world and our life is protected because we have it. But the real protection and blessing comes from reading it. Lord, may we be people of one book. People who know more about this book than anything else. People who have only one desire, and that is to draw closer to you. To discern your heart. To listen to your story. To understand your depths. To be able to live and move and grow in this world you live in because we are children of this book. Lord, may this book be like food. May we hunger for it. May we thirst for it. May we feel the pangs of emptiness when it is not inside of us. May we contemplate it. May we chew it. May we swallow it. May it become part of us. 
May these words be in our DNA. May we be able to repeat it when we need its strength and protection. May it guide us and may it bring us peace. Lord, looking at the world around us, we can only be more positive, more assured that we all need more of this book in our country. We all need more of this book in our world. If there's going to be anything that unites us, brings us together, tears down walls, puts us all on the right path, Lord, it is your book. May your church lead the way. May your church be the example in word and deed and action. May I be a person who hears these words and puts them into practice. Thank you for my Bible. Thank you for the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for being with us this morning. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening to us on audio or watching us on uh, YouTube. Of course, you know this is a computer file and it's out there on the internet. You can easily either download this to your phone and you can listen to it while you jog or run or work outside, or you can clip and copy the URL up at the top and post it to your own Facebook wall or a friend's wall if you think it might encourage them today. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.